What's happening, folks? Geologist Philip Prince back in the Appalachians today answering a viewer question. What is under Northern Virginia? Uh, answer, big geology. Really interesting looking geology, too, here. Looking at, a, I think, Shenandoah and Warren County, just south of Winchester. Uh, this is what the background landscape there looks like. You can see all the way up across the Potomac River there into Maryland. Hagerstown, I think that's Gaithersburg uh, to its right. Dulles Airport's sort of right off the edge of the screen there. Uh, the, the viewer question was, is the landscape and the structural geology that you see up in this part of the Appalachians uh, similar to what I portrayed in another video, which is down on the North Carolina-Tennessee line uh, near Johnson City? Uh, and the answer is, as you can probably see comparing these two and in, in a lot of ways there's there's similarities here now there are differences as well but ultimately you could put a geologist in one place or the other and and they certainly wouldn't be wouldn't be lost in the sense that there would be uh, enough resemblance between the uh, between the two settings so one big difference that immediately jumps out though uh, and and sort of defines this part of more central Appalachia is that the geology is big there, like the structures are really big. Um, looking here at about 37,000 feet of rock, uh, the blue layer there, which is uh, which is limestone and dolomite, uh, is a good bit thicker than corresponding horizons further to the south. And if you compare those block models there one to one, it, it is just is bigger in, uh, in northern Virginia. And you would have to get all the way down to... Um, to around Roanoke, really, uh, and, and south of Roanoke to start seeing uh, thicknesses and styles like you see up there in the uh, in the top diagram starting to develop. But the gray layer uh, represents the same same material. Um, the the purple uh, and the blue uh, in the bigger diagram there in the background correspond. I didn't color these the same, probably should have. But uh, ultimately, the you know you you, you can. You could say that that Blue Ridge Appalachia into Valley and Ridge Appalachia has got you know it's got a lot of similarities going on. Uh, in terms of the the big structure that's twenty four thousand feet tall under the ground, um, that's it right there. There's plenty more of them, uh, and that just gives you a sense of the physical size of of structure in this part of the world, particularly compared to uh, to surface topography. If you can see the uh, like the little ridges here portrayed where this light color sandstone layer reaches the surface. Um, you know, a few hundred feet of topographic relief at the ground surface versus tens of thousands of feet uh, of, of structural size below the ground, which is really cool to think about. Um, you know, Mount, Mount Everest, Chomolung, the 29,035 whatever feet, feet above sea level. Um, thinking about its height in terms of its prominence of the surrounding landscapes the it's kind of difficult to do because of where it sits in the himalayas but twenty four thousand feet is big um and when when you see structure drafted just as a cross section you don't really get a you don't really get a feeling for that it's nice to see it uh actually in this kind of cutaway view here um same rock types you talked about in the other other location. Uh, the blue layer there is the is the Cambrian and to Ordovician age carbonate rocks, dolomite and limestone. Got a shale above that. They call that the Martinsburg up here. Um, pretty well known geologic unit because among other things, you can see there's a lot of orange there. It gets really really thick uh, in some areas. Sandstone horizon above that. The interlayered sandstone and shale, but that sandstone that's the light colored layer uh, makes ridges in the landscape has a limestone right on top of it and then more shale and sandstone above that. Uh, and if you look at just kind of the overall effect of the diagram here, uh, you can see that the land surface and what it looks like actually corresponds to the geology, right? So you got the sandstone layer here, dark green forested, rough country, can't build on it. Got this orange layer at the surface and it kind of makes this belt of like kind of slightly slightly darker land surface there's more trees and undeveloped land on that than there is where the blue layer the the limestones and dolomites are at the surface they're really good farmland get over here into shale and sandstone land rough country dark uh not nearly as agricultural as the valley this actually is the shenandoah valley with the shenandoah river coming down it uh, has been farmland for hundreds of years at this point get over to the right side where the gray rock is at the surface also rough country, uh, a little more rugged topography, 
and you don't see a lot of agriculture there as well. So structural geology and where those layers meet the surface very much controls what's on the land, what life is like, uh, sort of your world as you know it is very much connected to uh, to what's under the ground and how much of it uh, is actually exposed up on the land surface. Got the deeper rocks there. The one thing I didn't include here uh, would be that there is is greenstone uh, mixed into this to this nice and granite. It would be right on top of it, or in this case, right underneath this light blue layer. You've been up in Shenandoah. You've probably seen greenstone, heard about greenstone. Why do they call it greenstone? It's green. Uh, geologists can be very creative. Um, it's metamorphosed basalt. Uh, and it's, I mean, it's kind of a calling card of Shenandoah. And that's something you start to see uh, at the very top of what is the gray, the gray interval of rock in uh, in this part of the Blue Ridge. Um, now, the quartzite down there, light blue, uh, that's what's yellow in the other video. Um, that's a slightly metamorphic rock. And when it's exposed at the surface, it, it's good at making topography. And in this line of cross section, it's actually not even exposed at the surface. You've got the, uh, the, the older rock, which in this case would be greenstone, pushed right up on top of the, uh, of the limestone and dolomite and more shales all over the place. Now, again, when people were working on this area, um, I drew this up based on research done and cross sections done nearby. There's a cross section a little bit north of this. There's one a little bit south of this. Uh, you take the general idea of it, you take the thicknesses here, and basically you draw your geology to match the topography. Now, in this case, why were people worried about what was under the ground? Oil and gas. In this case, almost certainly gas, because these rocks would have been deep enough uh, when they were at their maximum burial depth that the temperatures they would have reached would have probably put them beyond uh, oil stability. You can drill down and get it pretty easily. Maybe go even check out the uh, the lower parts of that structure. There's another one. There's another one, and you could have even done that in the uh, in the one over to the right here, right? So no one ever did that. I don't think anyone is ever going to do that. Um, but that was the, that was the reason people cared about what's down under the surface, uh, in this area in exactly the same way, uh, that they did in the area I talked about in the other video. So, um, in terms of just the understanding and, and the ability to, to portray this and, you know, have, have some confidence about what's under the ground, you do know what's at the land surface, um, uh, that changes a lot when you get down deep, that's sort of the calling card of this area, uh, is the way that the blue layer stacks on top of itself down in the down in the subsurface. So you don't see that really dramatically expressed at the land surface, but people did the same thing, the seismic reflection profile, and got a sense of what's down here, uh, and were able to to sort of put this picture together. And when you're trying to do a cross section like this, this this depth down to the top of the gray layer is like the biggest thing that uh, that makes it all happen, right? Um, if you're to zoom in even closer, talked earlier about the orange layer, what we call the Martinsburg. Uh, it's it's shale, and it would be just really mashed up and in incredibly complex patterns. Uh, if you ever saw a lot of it exposed, that would be evident. But suffice it to say, uh, there's places here where if you went straight down, you would pass through literally thousands of feet um, of that same of that same rock layer. Its original thickness would be a small fraction of that too. It's been kind of like raked up and and mashed up into uh, into huge collections there, in association with uh, with these different structures. Um, the way the the geology up here, much like it does anywhere in the Appalachians, controls the landscape is really cool. Um, probably the best examples for that orange layer. Again, the Martinsburg uh, is up on the surface. This is actually into Massanutten Mountain. Um, so if you've been in this part of Virginia driving on 81, you've definitely seen Massanutten. Uh, the Martinsburg is, is exposed on either side of that. Again, it's kind of making that dark green area. Uh, and the North Fork of the Shenandoah River as these crazy meanders uh, where it has kind of localized itself in that Martinsburg shale. So they're, they're really interesting to look at. And you can imagine how long it would take you to like canoe down that or something. If you straighten that river out, it would be quite long uh, compared to how long it actually is point to point on a map in terms of land distance there. Uh, and the reason it's meanders are, are sort of confined as they are, is the river has found that more uh that kind of more favorable bedrock to be cutting into uh, if you look at 
the the details of this landscape in lidar it's really cool too you can see these like folded sandstone ridges um this is over west of interstate 81 uh this would be where one of those almost white sandstone layers i had in the cross section would be up at the land surface um really crazy like zigzag patterns and things like that and that's where the where the folded layer has been sort of cut off by by erosion uh the shale landscape very different uh, almost kind of like a badlands like really closely spaced little ravines and almost gullies so geology is uh, again very much shaping the land surface here but that's that's a very um like a conspicuously appalachian thing anywhere you go in appalachia to some extent uh when you look at the land surface you're you're basically looking at a at a geologic map and when we hop out to to paint here uh pretty shortly probably touch on on what makes these crazy patterns again there um so thinking thinking more about like oil and gas exploration um mentioned it in the last videos paper by byron q lander and stuart dean of 1986 pretty much did this subsurface thing on all of appalachia um you may notice this looks a lot like what i drafted earlier there's not really a way for it for it not to um what i drew would be somewhere between like section two and and section three so it's basically sort of a like a blend almost of of the two of those uh the reason this is is interesting is that in southwest virginia the the valley and ridge that interstate 81 is running down the the rock section that has has folded and sort of stacked up on top of itself stacks up very differently uh, and it's much, much thinner and smaller. Um, the valley and ridge and what's underneath it in Northern Virginia and Maryland, and particularly Pennsylvania, is absolutely like huge volumetrically compared to uh, to what's down there in Southwest Virginia. So it's neat to uh, to put these together and see this one to one. When this was originally published, it's just uh, it was like black and white line work. Um, this is part of a project I did a few years ago where I took the black and white, stitched them together drafted them together, colored them all up so you could sort of do a, a, a quick and easy comparison. So they're very different places, but all of them have this interesting subsurface structure where the rock units have kind of stacked up and over one another. And that's what people were really, really interested in back in the, back in the 70s and 80s. So what you just saw there, the, the Southern Cross sections are from down in this area. It's around Roanoke, Blacksburg area. Uh, that's how wide the Valley Ridge is there. That's how wide it is up is up uh, in Northern Virginia in the Maryland, uh, and actually this is this is Massanutten Mountain right here. Uh, I think the ski resorts down here at the south end of it, if I'm not mistaken. But the section we started off with uh, would be something like that, clipping just the north end uh, of Massanutten there. So, in terms of comparing this to like the rest of the Appalachians. This is another diagram I did for another thing several years ago. Um, this is down along I-77, uh, northwest of Withville, Virginia. Same kind of a theme, but the, the stacking pattern is very differently. In this case, the blue layer has been pushed many, many miles up on top of itself. This takes you actually out into like West Virginia coal fields here, uh, southwest of Princeton, getting down towards Bluefield. Um, Abs Valley area, Pocahontas, really famous coal mining neck of the woods. And just cut off on the edge of the screen there, if you could see that number, it would say 17,000 feet. So I think what we were looking at first off was like 37,000 feet top to bottom. Um, top to bottom here would be like 20 or 21 or something like that. So pretty tremendous difference uh, in terms of both thickness, overall pattern, but the same relationship between the geologic structure and the topography exists here again, like it does everywhere in the Appalachians, uh, where these yellow layers are reaching the surface. That's a big, strong sandstone. It's quite thin, but that's what, what makes the mountains. These mountains that stick up almost 2,000 feet above the surrounding valleys, uh, they're propped up on just a few hundred feet of sandstone there. Uh, likewise, carbonate rocks there, they make these nice valleys. Once you get out here into West Virginia, um, shale and sandstone, almost flat lying, all bets are off there. That's kind of its own video. Crazy landscape out there, but one that's very different from where these other rocks are, uh, are at the land surface, right? So that is the mystery of the 24,000 foot tall thing that's, uh, that's under Northern Virginia. Um, structural geology, it's where a sequence of, of rock has been just like 
pushed up and over stacked up on top of itself, just like we were talking about down in Tennessee and North Carolina. Same general idea. The subtleties are there that distinguish the two uh, and really make this one, I don't know, this is a this is a cool part of Appalachia. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, when you get up into Pennsylvania, this theme continues, but it it gets even crazier. So it's a it's a really neat spot to look at, which also probably uh, deserves its own video. But we're gonna do the pain thing here. Uh, hop out and draft some of this out and talk about what uh, this whole like stacking on top of itself idea represents uh, and how these different layers put together in different structures would uh, would impact the landscape. So heading to paint, hold on just a moment. All right, paint back again, like we never left. Um, gonna try to try to sketch out here. Um, some of the ideas is I keep saying like this was stacked on top of itself or something like that. Uh, if you're in the Appalachian mountains, that's a concept you're going to be dealing with. Um, in the North Carolina, Tennessee video, uh, there's a little, like a sandbox model, a physical model um, that that demonstrated that process. Tons of those on my page. If you cruise around on it, you will most certainly find one. But fundamentally, at the end of the day, um, this whole stack on top of itself idea is a way of taking something that's long and skinny. So this would represent a big expanse of sedimentary layers um, that is much longer, wider than it than it is thick. And if you crunch that from one end to shorten it down, it will sort of stack on top of itself to get shorter. Uh, it will end up taking up more more vertical space when this happens so the overall the overall effect will be that it 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 thickens um in terms of how much of it's in the subsurface right so that's how you end up with the with the 25 24 000 foot tall or whatever structure um there are places in the appalachians where you can get um probably even a slightly greater thickness of that basically that single rock horizon um I'm not sure if it touches 30 or not. Again, there might be places um, in in Pennsylvania, um, under the Great Valley of Pennsylvania, where, where legitimately there might be as much as like 30,000 feet of that blue layer. It's not anywhere near that thick itself, but if you stack it on top of itself enough times, it's going to take up a whole lot more room, right? So what you just saw in this video is uh, is kind of like kind of like this option, how there's other ways to do this. So say we shorten it the same amount, but instead of making all those kind of dinky little wrinkles there, uh, say you did something like this, where you only had maybe three repetitions of the layer pack, but each one of them accommodates way more way more shortening right so you can either break this thing three times and sort of like completely stack it on top of itself or break it what six times up there and and move it just a little bit now the difference in the bottom one there that's what you see in southern appalachia uh the top one is what you get in central appalachians up into pennsylvania um the bottom one tends to be thinner uh, and there tends to be more kind of more of these sliding surfaces. So you don't, you, you get equally as many repetitions. There's places where, where parts of, you know, what would be this, what would be this purple layer uh, down in the Southern Appalachians. And I say parts of it are stacked on top of top of themselves like four times or something like that, but it, it's not the full thing. So you're not going to end up just because, among other things, of the thickness uh, of the valley ridge down there. So in Appalachia, you're not going to get that like thirty thousand foot pile or whatever. But that's what that's what the stacking represents, right? So if you wanted to uh, kind of take this to next level here, uh, let's see if we can white out a bunch of that. Okay. Um, what what would these different patterns do to the landscape, right? So uh, 
talked about the kind of zigzag ridges and whatever. So if you had, give me the, come on, there we go. Uh, if you had a pattern kind of like that central Appalachian style, so you had something like this, and you got... Say there's a layer above that that has to be has to be crunched and shortened as well. Um, you might not see it stacked on top of itself quite the same way. But you could like wrinkle it up like an accordion and and make it shorter in the same fashion. Um, and let's say that's what's like poking out at the that's what's poking out at the land surface there. Um, that's going to make like these really crazy complex ridge patterns, sort of like what you saw there um, in the uh, in that gray lidar image with the uh, with the zigzags, right? So how the how the layers have responded to being crunched and shortened controls their their geometries and that in turn controls the landscape. So if we wanted to get very serious with this uh, and try to do, Try to do one of the full, one of the full scale block diagrams. I don't know if I got it in me. We're gonna give it a shot. Um, start off with that deeper, what we call basement rock down there at depth. Uh, that ain't gonna work. I'm gonna have some of that pushed. Up and over itself. I already knew that. Uh, we'll go back to the brush now, and we'll go ahead and try to like fill in a fill in a land surface here. So that's going to be the Blue Ridge over there on the right. And what I just drew there is going to be what sometimes they call like the Allegheny Front. That's going to be a a big a big piece of topography right there in uh in West Virginia. This is going to be exaggerated a little bit, but sometimes that's a good thing to do uh, just to be sure that the patterns that you want to show um, are visible there. And uh, this is getting drawn in a little bit different order than the other one, but from here we're going to go and just build up the patterns in those deeper sedimentary structures where that blue layer is like broken and stacked on top of itself so many times in the uh, in the block diagram that is somewhat more official than this one. Oh my god. Come at it from this side. And so that one out there at the end has actually been raised up a little bit, a little bit higher, right? So now we'll go more notable color. And this is going to be that sandstone layer that it just seems like is everywhere in a lot of places. And what I've done here uh, is shown where it's actually going to be. And we should probably wipe that, wipe that out and drop the landscape down where the, uh, where the deeper layers are pushed up, that can actually lift that uh, that can lift that sandstone up enough where it wears away and starts to expose the uh, deeper layers underneath it. Um, so we should probably try to to fill in uh, a landscape here. Here's a little bit lighter color so we can see the uh, the topography hatching on it here that we're gonna do. Okay, getting there, getting there. Oh. Making it hard on me. It's probably not even going to be possible to get enough detail uh, along some of these areas. So we'll just kind of 
We'll just kind of turn it green. And if you're watching this, it's probably like, well, looks kind of like you just draw the same thing every time. And that's not quite the case, but it actually should look that way because the, the whole point of this video is to show that, that there's a, a lot of similarity uh, throughout the Appalachian Blue Ridge and, and Valley Ridge. So let's fill in some of these holes here. Looking good. All right, no problem. Looking good. Okay. Um, so I think in this case, I might just, I might just purple in the, uh, the deep layer here that represents the limestone and dolomite that's stacked on top of itself. Uh, and if you're wondering where it is here, it should be there. So we'll, we'll mark it in there. Certainly it won't be making high topography, so we'll lower it down some. Back to it. There we go. We'll fill these in. And uh, I don't know how many of these repetitions are in some of those cross sections, probably like 10 or 12 or 13. But uh, that's that's almost certainly what's down there. It's There's not really a good way to explain the, uh, the surface geology without it. So it's kind of cool. There's other places on Earth that show... Uh, similar geologic styles, but that one's pretty, it stands out pretty good. Okay. Going to make it maybe almost there. All right. So at this point, uh, I'll probably start to fill in some topography there and show this Allegheny front there. That's basically the, the edge of where the rocks have really been folded and crunched. There's still a little bit of folding out there. It's not as extreme. Um, let me start filling in some of these ridges related to this really complex structure here. And it's almost hard to draw these simply because their size relative to the overall system here is just not is not very large but you could end up with as you made your way from virginia into west virginia it would be possible to see the same layer of rock at the surface and then see it disappear see it come back again 20 30 40 times who knows i mean it's it's a it's very distinct from a from what you get down towards Tennessee. Okay, so we're getting some there now. So the the fundamental takeaway uh, is that this produces a really complex, a really complex landscape. And momentarily here, we're going to turn this into the Southern style landscape. And my sincere hope is that this looks really cool fast forwarded at the start of the video. I would be very surprised if anyone makes it this far and is still watching. But when we speed it up, maybe it's going to do what it needs to do. Okay. Cool. So let's make sure we might be able to fill in a few details here. That color's terrible. Can I have a little more? Ooh. Work. So this is like that that Martinsburg layer. So we'll fill in all the fill in all the holes here. Okay. And if you're sort of the real deal doing a cross section like this, based on data that someone's actually going to use for decision making, uh, a goal for it is for it to be set up in such a way uh, that you can take it and sort of like stretch it all back out and have everything um, 
basically go back to the same place it's called restoring it but you want to be sure that that five repetitions of purple shortens purple the same amount as the 50 or whatever wrinkles or repetitions of that kind of maroon layer so it's a it's a serious thing to get into um pretty unique skill sort of a unique thing actually to the the practice of geology i guess it almost has more in common with like it's like architecture or something like that it's not something that you hear about very much uh, when people think about what a geologist does Red there. That's red there. Last one, we use kind of a sky blue for the, for the quartzite. Let's see if I can just make that one bigger. All right. Ooh. Almost home. Almost home. Need just a couple more colors here. Mm -hmm. okay. Cool. There we go. So that's kind of the kind of the vibe that you get there in uh in the northern part of Virginia. Uh and then you would have something like interstate you know 81 kind of running down it um so how would you after going through all that how would you turn this into uh southern appalachia uh see if we can do that pretty quick here So the first thing that would change is the gray would be pushed in over the blue, which would be pushed in over the purple. And I need to have the red in here. Okay, so you need to change that. And then you would need to start bringing purple up to the surface. I have to slide over a bunch of this just so you can. be more like uh like a southern appalachian style where the blue layer has been stacked on itself fewer times but the distance that 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 stacking that thrust faulting has moved is huge uh compared to what you see further to the north uh and there you get maybe like three three big ridges uh instead of like 20 or 30 really small ridges that sort of connect and, and get lost amongst one another. So really cool neck of the woods. Um, hopefully, if you look at this on Google Maps again, you'd be thinking about geologic structure because that's what makes the Appalachians, right? There's other mountain ranges in the world that show the, the rock type contrast in, in terms of what they look like. I mean, just about anyone does to some extent, but probably there's not another one quite like the Appalachians where very thin layers, as long as there's something like sandstone, uh, end up making a huge, huge impact on, on what the land actually looks like. So hope you enjoyed this, uh, and we'll try to see what's next.